Church, you're blessed to be here in the house of God. And um, how, many of you are here, how many of you are not here this morning? How many of you are not here this morning? Okay, a few hands. How many of you were here this morning? How many of you, how many of you don't know where you were this morning? Okay, what did you say, sir? They came back, that's right. See, they heard me that's preach good. and they came back. <laughs> so, welcome. My name's Ashley. It's my wife, Carly, and we have Terridez Ministries. We're based out of Colorado, but as you can tell by our accents, that we're not from Colorado, from, from, from out east, way out east. Way out east. About four and a half thousand miles from way England. East. And um, we, uh, we actually we have offices in South Africa as well. So, we love your pastors. We can understand their accents, which is awesome. It's always a bonus. So, if this is. If this is your home church, I said this this morning, but I'll say it again. Congratulations, because you go to a great church. You go to a yeah. church going to build you up in the body of Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And you have great pastors. Yeah. And uh, the more we get to know your pastors, the more we love them. So you're in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing with the right That's people. It. That's it. Amen. And uh, so it's we love your pastors. Pastors Shannon and Karen, thank you for having us. Thank you. It's an honor to, to, to minister uh, to, your, to your church. I, I say it's a little bit like having a babysitter. You don't just have anyone. Come and babysit right. here. So not, not, not that we're people. babysitting, but it's like it's very important to have that's a bad analogy. There Scratch that analogy. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's an honor to be able to, to feed the sheep of this house. So praise God. And then a um, couple of things real quickly before Carly ministers is uh, we've got some product back there. It's nearly all gone, but a couple of things. One, yeah, there's, there's still stuff things. left. Mm -hmm. If you're here on your own and your spouse didn't come, your spouse called me. They said you can buy whatever you want. Okay. <laughs> Spend all the money you want. But uh, we got stuff back there. And uh, we, and if uh, you're single, ready to mingle, you don't have to ask anyone. Single, right? ready to mingle. And there's, um, so there's some stuff back there. And if for some reason there's something particularly you want that's not there, they will order it for you at the conference price. We have special prices for churches and conferences. So at the special reduced price, and we will uh, ship it out to you. We won't charge you anything for shipping or anything. So we'll do that for you. But here's yep. a few things we have left. We have a, a teaching here called the God Plan. Yeah. And the God Plan, it says it's better than you think. How many of you know, without a shadow of a doubt, you are in? God's plan right now okay okay how many of you are not sure if you're in God's plan or not okay you how many of you are too scared yeah. to put your hand up because you don't admit this okay you know sometimes finding the plan of God for our lives can be seem pretty difficult this is a four-part teaching it's actually four CDs if you still use CDs yeah. or it's also uh, it also has an mp3 download included so you can either put it on your computer or you can use the CDs it's four parts mm -hmm. and we go into depth of how you can find God's will for your life, how you can find God's plan for your yep. life. So who doesn't know God's plan for their life and feels like they need to know God's plan? I'll let Pastor T get that away. Thank you, Pastor T. And then um, this is a little teaching I did a while ago. It's, not, it's a little case, but it's a big teaching. It's 20 lessons, 20 audio lessons, video lessons. There's yep. cheat sheets in here. There's all sorts of stuff in here. And let me tell you, this is actually, um, this is not for everyone because this is actually a course on how to make extra money. Is that, that's right. So all my Some life... Some people don't want any extra no, money. All my life, I've always loved, <laughs> even since, since I was like 10 years old, I've always loved to buy and sell things. You know, Craigslist, eBay, Facebook Marketplace, that type of thing. So I've always bought and sell, sold stuff. So someone said to me, you should make a course on that. So I rented a, a, a media studio. This is before we had our own studio. And we actually, I hired actors to actually act out how to negotiate, how to stay safe it's and all that. It's quite fun, actually. It's a fun course. It's not for everyone. I guarantee you it will not make you a millionaire overnight. If it does, it's your money back. It's not a get rich quick. But I have a lot of testimonies of people taking this course and they go out and make a few hundred dollars on a Saturday or make a few thousand dollars extra on a week or two. Uh, I have people actually doing this full time. I was a friend of mine in Arizona. He does this full time. And I heard from him the other day, he made $140,000. That's not bad, is it? Praise the Lord. So anyway, all from change. buying and selling stuff. So anyway, um, this is called Buy, Sell, Repeat. And but it's all you about need to tell them the reason why you put that together. The reason why I put it together was to help people make money so they could give more. Yeah. I say the easier it is, it's true. Listen, to the church, to, to missionaries, to sponsor children, to everywhere. The easier it is to make money, the easier it is to give money. Now, maybe I'm just carnal, but if you work all, like, imagine you do a hard work, uh, a week's work all week, and you're getting up early, and you're, you're, you're sweating and toiling for a whole week, and you get $1,000, say, and then you come to church, and a missionary comes through, and the Lord says, give that missionary $1,000. Or... You go and buy something for like $1,000 and sell it for $2,000 and it takes you about half an hour. Now, I'm, maybe I'm not very spiritual, but I find it easier to give $1,000 when I've just made $1,000 in half an hour than when it's took me all week or all month to make $1,000. So I guess that's the main thing. The easier, the easier it, is to it make comes, money. the easier it goes. The easier it is to make money, the more you can give money. So ultimately, it's all about giving. You know, Deuteronomy 8.18 says he's given us the power to get wealth. Yeah. 
I spoke on this this morning. If you didn't watch this morning, you can go back and watch afterwards. But he gave you the power to get wealth. Why? So he can establish his covenant. So he can tell people how much he loves them. So mm-hmm. he can spread the good news. It costs money to run Lake Haven Church. It costs money to run Lake Haven TV. It costs money to, for us to travel around the world. It costs money to sponsor children. It costs mm-hmm. money to clothe people and house people. It costs money to spread the gospel. Mm-hmm. And that's why I want money in the kingdom. So anyway, who, who's ever done Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, likes doing that type of thing? This lady here, maybe I'll let Pastor D find someone so I won't be the bad guy. But you can, you can find someone who knows do that. They're available back there. And um, this is uh, Carly's latest book called All Is Not Lost, mm-hmm. and this is uh, called Your Path from Trauma to Victory. And, um, you know, Kylie suffered a lot of trauma, nine years of, of mm-hmm. abuse and trauma in her life uh, before we met. And um, this, uh, this book will really help you. If you've ever had, unfortunately, it's too common that people have been through trauma, abuse, past that are, that are laden with things. And we know people in their 80s and 90s that are still suffering from childhood trauma or childhood abuse. So God doesn't want that for you. He wants you set free. This book will help you get, get set free in your soul and in your, in your mind. It's really going to help you. Dr. Doug Weiss wrote the foreword. He's a world expert on this. He's been on Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Phil and all that. And he, he loved this book, so he wrote the foreword. So this will really help you if you've had any type of trauma or you know anyone who's had trauma or abuse in their past. This is going to help you. And it's not a book about whining and complaining about the abuse and the trauma. It's a book about how to get set free and the walking victory, in victory, walking in victory Amen. that Jesus already provided for you. So if someone, someone needs that book, hold your, hold your hand up and, and Pastor T will give that to you. Praise the Lord. A couple of other things real quick. If you're watching online, now we have an online audience. You can go to teradez.com. That's just our website, teradez.com, and find us there. Teradez.tv yep. is our YouTube channel. Our son, Josh, can't be with us today. He usually travels with us, but he's actually um, uh, got Next Gen TV. I know you have Next Gen You Feel. Yep. You've got Next Gen TV, so you can check him out. If you know any young people, you can go on our YouTube channel and see some of his videos and TikToks and Facebook and all that type of stuff, you know. You tweet face. <laughs> Snap face. If YouTube and Twitter and Facebook got together, if YouTube, Twitter and Facebook got together, they'd call it you tweet face. I got, I got a few laughs a there, few. Shannon. I still got some laughs. The joke's not dead yet. Dad I'm still getting laughs. Oh, strong. So we are so blessed. I'm excited for Carly's message tonight. You know, we see great things wherever we travel because we, we teach the word, we preach the word, and signs and wonders always follow the preaching of the word. If you're watching online, stay connected because you know what? You can receive wherever you are just as much as you can receive here. So you, you can receive and maybe let people know about this. Share it. Let people know about this. So we can get more and more people uh, set free and healed. Amen? Mm-hmm. In Jesus' name. So here's my wife. She's the co-founder of Toadies Ministries. Woo! Praise God. And she's a powerhouse. So you can have fun. So um, give them Heaven, baby. Oh, thank you, darling. Thank you, darling. Awesome. Awesome sauce. Very cool. I'm excited to be here. This is our first time coming to this part of Florida. We've uh, been to a few different towns in Florida and, uh, and all over. And one thing I've realized is it's pretty diverse, actually. You know, it's a, and it's a big state. Has anyone ever driven down to the Keys and got halfway and thought, how big is this state? It's bigger than it looks on the map. It's just like a little appendix, right? When you start driving, it goes on like down, you know, down to the Arctic or something, all the way down. My gosh. Anyway, excited to be here. I know that God has um, awesome things for us. We just uh, came from uh, some meetings with um, Andrew Womack over in Orlando. Were some of you there? Oh, awesome. Awesome. Were any of you there Friday night? It was fun. We had some great testimonies. For those that weren't there, you should go back and watch the live stream. It was pretty cool. But we had some great people testifying on, on Friday night. Probably 100 people actually gave testimony in the end. We had one guy that had um, he had multiple back surgeries, been in pain for 20 years. He came up on the stage. I was a bit, a bit concerned he hadn't seen the edge of the stage. So I'm like, don't leap off there. And he goes, oh, no, I'm going to jump. And he just, he just took a flying jump and landed. And he's like, I can jump. I mean, I'm like, that's pretty cool. But yeah, I know. I'm like, you know, when people do that, you're never quite sure how that's going to work out. You know, I'm like, I'm not want to hold you back, brother. I don't want to hold you back. We had another guy um, testify that he had metal rods in his back, wasn't able to bend. He'd had some sort of fusion with metal put in his spine. And he was able to bend over and touch his toes. He's, I don't know what happens to the metal, whether it turns to rubber or disappears or what it does but um he was completely healed lots of people testifying i remember one lady getting quite emotional she got new cartilage in her knees she didn't have any cartilage in her knees and um she was you know it's funny but several people who who testified and they were like i I wasn't expecting that when i came i'm like well did you expect then right you know (laughs) it's like you you come to a meeting and the power of god is there you know you're not going to leave the same way that's just how it is, right? If your heart is open and you want for you what God wants for you, when you come into the presence of God, you're going to receive it. So tonight, I want to talk about um, how, to be- how to receive what we believe. 
Has anybody, get our receiver on, right? Has anybody ever um, found themselves in a place of a little bit of frustration because they're speaking a whole lot and nothing much is happening, right? So that's what we're going to deal with tonight, okay? Because 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, Therefore, you know, having the same spirit of faith as Jesus, we have the faith of Jesus on the inside of us. If you've received Jesus, you've got, you know, the, 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 the healer living on the inside of you. He is not lacking in the faith department. That means you are not lacking in the faith department. If you've, who's received Jesus in here? That means you have the healer on the inside of you. And he is not worried about things. He's not concerned about things. He's not, you know, confused about things. He's the healer and he's very secure in his role, right? So we have the faith of Jesus in the inside of us. So it says, therefore, having the same spirit of faith as Jesus, we believe and therefore we speak. We believe and therefore we speak. Sometimes people do a whole lot of speaking and nothing happens. Have you noticed that? It's not fun, is it? Right? Because especially once you know the truth. You know, God wants us to be well. Right? Whether we have seen it manifest or not, it doesn't change the word. And this is really important because sometimes we allow what we see or hear in the world to stop us or hold us back from what we see or hear in the word. And that's a problem. Because the Word of God does not change whether you like it or not. The Word of God doesn't care whether you like it. It really doesn't. It's not going to change to appease you. It doesn't care whether you... I mean, if you believe it or not, it's still not going to change. But if you want what's in it, there needs to be some belief in it. Right? In order to receive what's in it, there needs to be some belief behind it. And sometimes we throw out a lot of good words that, say, that sound really good. I believe I'm healed. Right? I believe I receive. Okay, but we don't see any evidence of that. And this is where we need to come back to what's actually in our heart, because we can say a whole lot and not believe it. Has anyone ever said something they didn't really mean? Okay, we do it more often than we realize, don't we? We won't want to call them lies because we're saved. (laughs) Right. But here's the problem. When we're speaking something and on the inside we don't really believe it, what's happening in our body cells is a whole lot of confusion. Your body knows whether you believe what you say or not. It really does. It listens to you. You know, your body's voice activated, right? You were created with the word of God. God said, let there be trees, and boom, there were trees. There was light, and there was planets, and there was animals, right? He created you. You were created with the power of words. So words are powerful. But we can speak words, and they have no power in them. And then, you know, they could even sound like they're really good words, like they're all the right things. We could be speaking scripture and then we could be frustrated. And when that happens, I encourage people to go back and find out what is actually in your heart. Because we, uh, we can only receive what we first believe. So you can be speaking something and not seeing something. And part of that is an indication that there is a disconnect. Because God's word hasn't changed. God's word is still true right? But sometimes there are things that creep into our heart, creep into our believer in the way that we perceive God that causes confusion, that causes mixture in there. And usually these are the things of the world, right? Maybe the environment that we're in, maybe preconceived ideas that we have about God. Maybe there are things in in the scripture that we've been taught about God that just aren't true, right? Maybe we've had negative experiences or maybe we've had no experience. Maybe we're just brand new, Maybe we just don't know what to think because we just haven't experienced anything yet. All of these factors can play into what, what our condition our heart is in and how we approach God. And so I want to look at some of these things today in the Word. Let's turn in your Bibles. You should have Bibles here. Let's look at Matthew 9, verse 28 and verse 29. It says, When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? You know, there is a part of faith that includes trust and confidence. Trust and confidence. If we trust without confidence, we are not going to get the results that faith demands. I'm going to say that again because it's good. If we trust without confidence, we are not going to get the results that faith demands. Because it really isn't faith. Faith is trusting confidence, right? It's absolute to be full. Your heart is, Abraham, it was described this way. His heart was fully assured. He was fully persuaded that God was able. If our heart is not fully persuaded, if we don't have the trust and the confidence there together, what we'll find is we don't really have faith at all. What we have is a worldly kind of hope. 
And worldly kind of hope is like, man, I just hope when they pray for me, something's going to change. I've had 100 people pray for me, you know, and nothing's really happened. I'm going to say all the right words and I'm going to hope one of them sticks, right? There's a hope in that. I mean, it's positive, it's good, but it's not guaranteed. It's an unsecured hope. That's the problem. Now, that's worldly hope, unsecured hope. It's not based on any kind of guarantee. It's the kind of, kind of, kind of word that says, you know what, I hope a hurricane is not going to come through and take my roof off, right? But there's no faith in that. Faith says, hurricane, oh, don't you mess with my house. This house is protected. I'm a temple of the Holy Ghost, and this is, this is my house, and this is my, this is, right? I mean, that's the kind of faith that steps outside and says, you back off, you repent. Oh, I don't think so. You can go around the block, this one, right? Come on, you know a thing about storms living, living here in Florida, right? But, but you know, there's, so there's a difference between an unsecured hope and a secured hope. And the hope that we have in God, the trust that we have in God, is a hope that doesn't disappoint us. That's what it says in the scriptures. It is, we have a hope that doesn't disappoint us. And this is important because hope in itself is the very spark of faith. You know, we start in hope. Maybe we walked in here tonight and we said, you know what? My hope is in Jesus. I hope when I go to that meeting, something's going to change. I, my hope is in the Lord. And I, and I hope that when they pray for me, you know, I'm going to receive. And that's what got you in the door. But that's not what's going to get you to receive. That's a good start, Right? See, hope is, is part of our imagination. It creates something. The job of hope is to spark faith in you. It's, to, it's linked to your imagination, which creates a picture on the inside of you of the, something that's different from what it was when you walked in. So while you're sitting here, I want you to be imagining some things. I want you to be imagining what it means to be well. What does a well you look like? What does it look like? Because a well you just leap up out of bed in the morning with no aches and pains? Does a well you get up in the morning and not have to go through your library of prescription drugs? Does a, does a well you be able to go through the day without, you know, taking a nap? What is it? What is a well you? What does that look like on the inside of you? Does a well you look at your knees and see the swelling going down? Does a well you move without pain or discomfort or take off your glasses and, and see blurry turning to clear? What does a well you look like? We need to start imagining that is where hope is at. But what faith does, faith being trust and confidence, is it says, you know what? That picture belongs to me. It's not just in my imagination. It's who I am. It belongs to me. And I am fully persuaded. I have absolute trust and confidence in God that his picture on the inside of me is going to manifest on the outside of me. In fact, when I go in there and I come down and they, and they lay hands on me, you know what? I'm taking back what the devil stole. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm over it, Right? He says, I'm, I'm having it. I'm, 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 I'm leaving here with what God paid for me to have. Now, that's faith. You see, there's a progression there, right? Faith is trust and confidence. So Jesus asked him, what, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Belief's important. And he said, yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes. But look at this. He said, saying, according to your faith, your trust and your confidence, let it be done for you. And their eyes were opened. So Jesus could not do something for somebody outside of their willingness to believe it. There was still a determining factor here in the people that Jesus ministered to. If you follow Jesus' life, he actually provoked faith in people. He's like he poked them into faith, right? He asked them questions. Do you believe that, you know, what, that this is going to happen? Stretch out your hand, right? I mean, take up your bed and walk. You know, he called blind Bartimaeus from the other side of the room. Come over here, Bartimaeus. That was a walk of faith. He was still blind. There was a motion, there was a movement towards what Jesus was saying. He provoked faith in people, whether he asked them to perform an action or whether he asked them a question. He, uh, he found out where their faith was at because faith always has to be present in order for people to receive. Always. Now, if the people didn't bring it, Jesus did. Because I know some of you are thinking, what about the unsaved people? They were all unsaved, right? They didn't receive Jesus yet, Okay. Right? So that doesn't disqualify a person. It depends where they put their trust and their confidence, where they put their faith. So it says, according to your faith, let it be done to you. Jesus was not going around determining who was going to be healed. He wasn't. He wants everyone to be healed. Right? Everyone. Everyone that came was healed. You notice that? No one came into the presence of God and left unhealed. Right? Everyone that wanted to be healed was healed. He was not the determining factor. 
And, you know, there's only a couple of incidences where, where Jesus had to take somebody outside of the town. And he says he couldn't do many mighty works because of their unbelief. So what people believe in their heart can determine what they receive. God's not the determining factor. He has made up his mind. His promises are yes and amen. That means when we pray later, we don't have to beg God and ask him to do something like we've got to convince him into being a good mood and heal people. He's already decided. The answer is yes. Yes. doesn't matter what caused the problem. The answer is always Jesus. And his mood and his his answer is always yes and good. That's it. That's it. So the determining factor here is us. Look at this in Matthew 18, verse 13. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way. And as you have believed... In other words, you could say, in the way, in the manner that you're believing, right, so let it be done for you. This is interesting. His servant was healed that very same moment. Have you ever wondered why some people receive instantly and other people it's a process of time? Do you think God's determining that? Nope. It's according to the manner in which they're believing. So there's a determining factor here that's our heart. What do we believe in? When we come in here with our preconceived ideas, are our preconceived ideas about God matching up to the word of God or are they hindering us from receiving from God? Right? There's a little bit of, there's a little bit of gardening of the heart to do, isn't there? And sometimes I think, you know, we back off of the promises of God for different reasons, right? So maybe we start out in faith. We start out, you know, I believe, I receive. But then after a while, we get a little bit frustrated. Anyone found that? Right? Because we quit. You know, we give up. It takes a little bit. Everyone wants a microwave miracle. They do. We live in an instant generation, don't we? We, live, we, want, we want it all now. Well, the fact is your healing power, your, your healing is already on the inside. If you're born again, your spirit is full of the healing power of God. Right? So there's no time delay there. Sometimes there is a time delay here in our heart. And that's just how long it takes our heart to wrap itself around the goodness of God to a point where it can receive. You know, you can think about this. The parable of the sower teaches is this in Mark chapter 4, that Jesus threw the word, the seed, on several different types of ground. And some produced 30, some produced 60, some ground produced 100 times, 100-fold. Same seed, different conditions. Our heart condition is the condition of our soul, not our physical heart. Right? And that's the one that determines the type of, uh, type of response that we get from, from the seed. So sometimes we back off the promises of God, maybe because of fear, maybe because of negative, you know, past or whatever, trauma. You know, my, my test, as she was mentioning in my book, All Is Not Lost, a whole lot of trauma in there can color what's in your heart, can change the way you perceive things. It says in Proverbs that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Some of us are heart sick. Maybe it's the enemy. Maybe the enemy comes against you. Maybe, you know, there are things happen to you. that Maybe it's trauma. Maybe it's just bad experiences. Maybe it's something demonic, I don't know, that causes a lot of fear in your life. And, you know, all of these negative things, ultimately, we can blame on the devil. Really, he's the, he's the author of those things. You know, if we're confused, he's the author of confusion. He's the author of fear. He's the author of intimidation. And, and you know, here's the thing with the enemy. He knows potential when he sees it. He's been around people long enough, okay? So when he sees you, he sees potential. He sees that you are potentially dangerous to his kingdom. So he knows the only way to get in between you and that potential is to convince you out of it. That's all he's got. That's all he's got. Because he doesn't have any real power other than fear and intimidation. So if he can get you afraid, if he can get you intimidated, he knows you're going to back off of the promises that God already has for you to stop you reaching your full potential. He's trying to cause an intervention. He's trying to be an interrupter, right? I remember one time I was um, in Africa um, ministering, and we, ha- we had a day off, and we did like a little safari thing, uh, me and my friend, and we went on one of these safari things where they put you in a bus, you know, with the big bars on it and everything, and they drive you out into the, to the wilderness, and, and me and my friend Heather were there, and... You know, at some point there was a log in the road, so the the bus, a tree had fallen down, and the bus could not get, could not follow the path. So they, they gave us really strict instructions when we got on the bus: you keep your hands and arms inside the vehicle. These are wild animals out there; they can run very fast, very long distances, and they'll te- you know they they will use you as a snack in a heartbeat. So if something falls outside the bus, your camera, your hat, whatever, your cell phone, you know what? You're lost. We ain't going out to get it. It's over. Gone. Keep everything inside the vehicle. We were like, yes, sir. No worry about that. Well, when this log got in the road, there was an, there was an impasse. 
The only way around this was for the driver to get out of the bus and move the log. So I had a number of concerns about this, right? A number of concerns. I'm like, well, you know, I'm sure he's done this before. I'm sure, you know, this isn't the first time this has happened. So anyway... They, they, you know, him and the, the there, was a, there was like a tour guide person. They, they, they were like talking about things. They were getting a little bit concerned. Eventually, one of, one, one of them gets out of the bus. And he gets out of the bus and he goes around and he moves the log out, out of the way. And, you know, way over in the distance, they didn't look like there were any lions, tigers or anything wild around, you know. It looked like we were quite safe. Took a look around before we got out of the bus, right? But as he got out of the bus and he walked over, you know, 10, 10 foot, 20 foot away from the bus and started to move the log, he bent down, he was crouching down. Way in the distance, there was a lion coming. He saw that, he saw that man bending down from a long ways off. And those things, I mean, I don't know how fast they, they, they move, but they move pretty fast, okay? And he ran until he was getting closer and closer to the man. And the man, man, cool as a cucumber. I'm thinking... I would be sweating it by now, carries on moving this log. I mean, me, I would have been back in the bus, okay? But, I mean, he carries on moving this log to get it out of the way. And, I mean, he, this lion by this point was at full sprint and he was way too close for my comfort. I mean, he was probably between the stage and, you know, halfway in the, in the room here, okay? Right, so what is that? Is that 20 feet maybe? I don't know, 20, 20 feet away. And he was running. But what this man did, he just stood up and he put his hands in the air. And that line in that moment stopped dead in its tracks. And I thought, something is going on here that I know not of. (laughs) Because these are wild animals. They're not trained animals. These aren't ones that you find in the circus. These are out in the bush, okay? And he gets back on the bus. I'm like, what just happened there? And the Lord showed me, you know, when we crouch down to the enemy, he takes advantage of us. But the moment we stand up to him, we back him down. And here's the problem. This is the way that the, that the enemy tries to infiltrate our heart. He tries to use fear and intimidation. He tries to get us to back down off of the promises of God. But it's when we stand up to him in our full authority, we see him as this little pussycat. He's just a little kitten, really, right? He's the toothless lion. First Peter 5 says he roams around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Guess what? You're not his property. You're not, he doesn't have any rights over you. He doesn't have any rights over our body. When we got born again, we moved from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of the son of his love. The kingdom of light is what it says in Colossians. We are bought by a price. Jesus bought us. He paid the price for us. He redeemed us. He paid our ransom so we could be free from the power of sickness and the power of sin. See, but if we don't understand that, the devil will come with his fear and intimidation. He'll come with his condemnation and he'll come with his symptoms of sickness. And he'll try and back us down. And that's where we need to stand up to him. Not back down off of the promises of God. Because the problem is, if we back down on one area, where does it stop? If we back down on a cold, where does it stop? Right? Those things have an assignment. It says in Proverbs 28 verse 1, that the righteous are as bold as a lion. The righteous, that's us. We're the righteous. We're as bold as a lion. Actually, the first part of that makes me laugh. It says the wicked flee when no one pursues. So you've got a scripture there for not running. If you don't want to work out, right, you've got your scripture is right there. When you're tempted to hit the treadmill, no, only the wicked flee when no one's pursuing me. The righteous are as bold as a lion. We were not created to be timid. We were not created. Don't let the devil back you down. Now, I remember one time we had... Um, I was, I was at home, our kids were really small, and as she was at work, I mean, our daughter was probably three weeks old, she was like a newborn, and then we had a one-year-old and a two-year-old. Then we got a television after that, right? It was a busy season, we just had babies back to back. But we was at home, and we um, actually, Ashley used to be a used car salesman, right? And I know, I know, he got redeemed, don't worry. And uh, so... <laughs> 
it, it was it was pretty cool. It's a pretty cool story. I don't have time to tell it. But anyway, he was a used car salesman. We had a car lot. And we had an employee that we had to fire because he stole a car from us, right? He stole a car, went AWOL, and, and it was a mess. Anyway, he went rogue. This, this ex-employee went rogue, and he'd gotten involved with some really bad dudes in the neighborhood, um, some, some thugs, if you like, some uh, loan sharks, mafia-type people. I don't know what they were. They were bad dudes. And so he owed them a lot of money, and when they came to collect the money from him, he's like, don't touch me. This person has my paycheck. This person has my money. You need to go and get it from their house. I don't have any money, but they have all the money. You need to go over here. So they came knocking on our door, right? And um, this was, uh, you know, Ashley was at work, and there there I am with my three kids at home, home by myself, and I hear this banging on the door. Now, during this time, I've got the praise and worship music on. I'm having a great old time. We're praising the Lord. And and as the as the doorbell, he didn't, we didn't have a doorbell. He was rapping on the door, banging on the door. I thought, man, that sounds a bit intimidating. But, you know, the peace of God just filled that space. It, it filled that space. And there was, there was no concern in me. Now, normally, looking back on that, I should have been thinking, hey, somebody's trying to beat the door down. Probably not smart to open it. You know, maybe I should call the police. No, 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 just a thought. But, you know, in that moment, I didn't think that. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I went to open the door. And as I went to open the door, he tried to force the door open and push his way inside. He was a big guy. And boldness came over me. Now, you just don't want to mess with Mama Bear. And you don't want to mess with a mummy bear that prays, right? That's deadly. Yes, no, m- m- rule number one, right? Don't mess with a mummy bear. Don't mess with a num- mummy bear that prays. So, um, you know, he tried to force the door open, and there was just this boldness came upon me. And, I, and I, I'm like, hang on a minute, dude, basically. Open, opened the door wide up to him, and I stood there. And as you can see, I'm not particularly intimidating, But what came out of my mouth was words of fire. I spoke back to that devil that was trying to intimidate me. And I said, who do you think you are? He he made all these ugly threats. He says, I'm going to come in here trying to tell me what he was going to do to me, what he was going to do to the kids, how he was going to burn the house down, all kinds of ugly things that I'm not going to repeat. It was all, all fear and intimidation and aggression and hatred. Like he was just spewing the words of the enemy out right in that moment. But the moment that I stood up to him, he was stopped dead in his tracks. And it was the most supernatural thing. It was almost as if with every word I spoke back to him, it was like I swung a punch at him. Him. It was it was the, it was a supernatural moment in in that in that that space of time, and I don't know what he saw. I mean, I'm imagining maybe he saw angels or something behind me because you can see I'm not very not very big, not very yeah. It's that roaring lion. But with every word that I spoke, he took a step back until he was. We had probably I don't know ten twenty foot um, little path that went down to the road there. And with every word that I spoke, he stumbled backwards down the path until he was almost running backwards away from me. He got to the fence post, the little gate that we had at the end, until he was using it to hold himself up. He was shaking with fear. He took one last look at me or whoever was with me, and he took off running down the road. You know, we never saw him again. We called the police and they came round and they explained to us from the description who this, who this group of people actually were. They were really nasty dudes, right? They'd been after them for a while, been up to all kinds of uh, havoc in the neighborhood. But here's the thing. The righteous are as bold as a lion and the devil doesn't know what to do when we stand up to him. You see, he's not used to being resisted. He's not used to it. In our world today, people are very passive generally. But James 4, 7 says, submit to God, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. He'll flee from you. Our part is to get so confident in the word of God that we're not going to be backed down. You know, children that are confident will stand and talk to anybody, right? They don't care. Children that are secure are children that are confident, when a child is secure, when they know that they're loved, especially when their daddy's standing behind them, right? Suddenly the school bully doesn't want to know, right? You think about this. You know, I remember being, when I was a little kid, I used to get picked on a lot because I was little. And I had a, this, this school bully that kept stealing my pepperoni sausage. And it was, it was like a beef jerk. Yeah, pepperoni here, they're, they're like, no, they're called um, like, like the sticks of beef. You know the sticks of beef? Yeah. 
Slim Jims, okay? In England, they're called Pepper Armies. Okay, well, anyway, right? I guess this girl, she was, she was like, huge. She was, uh, and I was, like, five years old and in kindergarten. And she, you know, and I knew it was her because one day I caught her, do I caught her doing it. I saw her doing it. She'd just go into the cloakroom where we hung our lunchboxes and she'd take my, my pepperoni sausage out of, and it was the best part of my lunchbox, right? It was the thing I looked forward to the most. And I was just indignant about this, but I had to calculate my plan of attack, I'm like, she's bigger than me, she's stronger than me, and if I punch her, then I'm going to be in trouble. I was a scrapper. And so, <laughs> and small but feisty, okay? And, and so, like a chihuahua, I guess, right? <laughs> going to watch the small dogs. Um, and so I decided the only plan of attack, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the surprise attack. So, I, I, you know, in where we he put our lunch boxes, where there were coat pegs above it, like a bench, and then we'd put our, our lunch boxes underneath the bench, and then above the bench was a coat hook. So we'd have our, our coats on there. So all the coats were hanging up there on the rack. So I decided I knew what was going to happen. I'd made some excuse to go to the bathroom just before we break for lunch. And I went, instead of going to the bathroom, I went and hid behind the coats in the cloakroom. And I stood right behind my coat in the cloakroom. And she couldn't see me because my coat was as big as I was, right? All the way down. And so she couldn't see my little feet sticking out on the bench. And so when she came to get my lunchbox from under my feet, I leapt out on her. And I said, don't you be stealing my pepperami. It's mine. And you know what? She never stole my pepperami again. <laughs> like, that's how we resist the enemy, right? We have to stand up to the enemy. Otherwise, he is not going to submit. Right? He's just going to keep stealing your Slim Jim. Right? And if you're tired of someone else eating your Slim Jim, you're going to have to stand up to the playground bully. You just are. Right? He's just not going to say, oh, okay, then I've picked on that family enough. I'm going to try something else. He's going to keep going because while he's getting results, he's an opportunist. Right? Here's the thing. You know, 2 Timothy 1.7 says that, that God hasn't given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That means that fear has no place in a sound mind. Has no place. Has no place at all in a sound mind. It shouldn't even be part of us. We weren't created to have a capacity for the fear of nature. We weren't capacity. That, that capacity wasn't in us. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but, you know, fear wasn't created by God. It was created by, by Adam and Eve when they, when they believed in the lies of the enemy. You can find this in Genesis chapter 3. You go back there and you read the first time that fear appeared in the Bible. It said that they hid and they were afraid, right? That was right after they bought into the lies of the enemy. They bought into the lies of the enemy. And you see, the thing is, if we keep listening to the snake, if we keep listening to the lies of the enemy, if we keep listening to things, reports other than the Word of God, that could be the doctor's report, that could be our negative self-talk, that could be the opinions of others, that could be our previous experience, past negative experiences that are talking to us, we're putting more trust and more confidence or more faith in the lies of the enemy than we are in the Word of God. And that's a problem because it's going to cause confusion in our hearts. Fear is nothing but misplaced faith. Think about that. They perverted something that, that God had given them but that was supposed to be precious between, between them and God, their relationship with God, that trust, that confidence, that security that was only supposed to be present between them and their father, their creator. And they put more stock in the lies of the enemy and fear entered their hearts. Shame entered their hearts. Condemnation emptied their hearts. And they, and they hid themselves, right? The rest is history. That's where sickness and, and sin and everything else entered in. You know, we have to be guarding against those things in our life and be speaking boldly against them. We cannot, we cannot be passive. I want to look at some scripture here. Of a, this is the story of the, the Shunammite woman. Now, um, Ashley read in 2 Kings 4 um, early today the first part of that. I want to go a little bit later on. This is the story of Elisha as he passed through Shunam. Okay, from verse 8. It says, He passed by there, and a noble woman um, urged him to eat a meal. Whenever he passed by there, he stopped to eat. And, um, you know, they knew that he was a holy man. It says they made a little room for him. They put a table, a lamp, a chair. They made room for the prophet of God. They made room for God in their life. This is important. If we want to receive what we're believing for, we've got to make room for God in our life. 
Make room for his promises in our life. Make room for his promises in our expectation, in our imagination, in our words, right? He says so that he could stay there. So, you know, he has a conversation uh, with them one day. He says um, to get Hazar in verse 12, his servant called this woman um, and asked him, you know, you've, you've gone to all this trouble for us. What can I do for you? And, you know, it, it comes out that, um, she, that she was barren, that she wasn't able to have children. And so he speaks over her a word that at this time in this, in this season, you will embrace a son. And indeed, she went on to have a son. It says the woman conceived in verse 17. Uh, just as Elisha had told her, but when he was older, he went out one day to his father in, in the field, and he, you know, he said, "My head, my head," and they took him to his mother. And now he was small enough to be able to sit on her knees, so he may have been like five or six, not not too old. And then he died. Now, sometimes we have promises from God, and you know what? There is a re- the enemy is real, and we have to contend for those promises. And you know, we cannot give up at the first sign of resistance. Sometimes people miss their miracle because they quit too soon. Either we believe the word or we don't believe the word. That's it, right? Either the word is all true or it's not true at all. We can't have it both ways. I mean, I have compassion, okay, because we've we've got a lot of testimonies. We've been through a lot of trials. That gives you a lot of testimonies. If you have a test, you get a testimony. You can't have a testimony without a test, right? But, but But here's the thing, you know, in the middle of that contending, Sometimes if the season is a little longer than you anticipated, it's easy to quit, right? But if you want to receive what you believe, quitting is not an option. I know it might feel like it. I know it might be hard. I know it might be long. But we're not, we have to resolve in ourselves that we're going to believe the word of God above all else. And, and the devil might contend for it, but he's not going to win, right? He's not going to win. So this woman, she had to hold on to her promise. And I want to show you a few things that she did to hold on to a promise when she was in the middle of contending. Is that all right? Because I believe this is going to help some people to, to not quit and to actually receive what they, what they are believing for. He says she did a few things. He says she, as soon as she, she got this news here, she said um, she called to her husband, send one. No, she didn't tell her husband everything that had happened. Notice what she didn't do as well as what she did do. She didn't spill how she felt about the situation. This is kind of important because, you know, the the power of life and death are in our tongue. They are. And whether we like it or not, there there are those words that come out of our mouth are like seeds and they will produce a harvest. It just depends what kind of harvest you want, good or bad. They're going to produce something, right? So she didn't say, you know what, our son's died, husband, and, um, and this is terrible, and I'm really mad, and I'm devastated, and I'm in grief, and I'm really upset, and I, and I hate God, and it's all his fault. She didn't, you know, all of those things would have been justified, wouldn't they? You, this is, you couldn't get a worse report. There is nothing more tragic than the loss of a child. But this woman inspires me, okay? She inspires me because of how she keeps her mind focused on the promise. That was a child of promise, And no devil in hell was going to take that promise from her, right? She had waited a long time for that promise. And that promise had come to fruition, and she wasn't going to give up on it so easily. She wasn't going to give up on him so easily. You know, some of us have dreams and visions and word prophecies that people have spoken to us over the years. And when we don't see them come to pass in the time frame that we think that they should, it's really easy to get discouraged, but some of those, some of those things that you know, those conditions surrounding that that clock, is because we put a timer on something. We have to make sure that we are not attached to a clock because God's outside of time. He's outside of time, right? He a, a thousand days is like a day to him. He can move a mountain in a heartbeat. Okay, so we have to we have to stop putting conditions on the promises of God that God never set with them. Because we'll find ourselves in disappointment. And so anyway, she says, send me to one of the servants. She gets a donkey. She rides off to, to find the, the man of God, the prophet God. And the only thing that comes out of her mouth is, it shall be well. It shall be well. Okay, you're going to get different. It is well. It shall be well. I think is what it says in the King James. It shall be well. She speaks the desired end result, knowing full well at that point it's not well. You see the difference there? Was it well in the natural Oh, no. It was very unwell in the natural. He was dead. You couldn't get more unwell than dead, right? But rather than speak out what she saw or what she felt, she spoke out what she wanted to see. 
She spoke out the desired end result. That's really important. In the moment of our crisis, we need to be speaking out the agreement that we have with God's word. We need to be saying the same as about our situation that God says about our situation. As she shared this morning, the testimony of our daughter that was healed. She was three years old, sent home from the hospital to die from an incurable autoimmune disease that meant she couldn't eat anything. Basically, she was on a feeding tube. She was given just days to live. We took her to a conference. She was prayed for, and God instantaneously healed her. I mean, it was a miracle. And that was, she was three then. She's 20 now. She's had a baby, right? So she's a miracle, and her baby's a miracle because she, she didn't make it. The baby wouldn't be here either. Double miracle right there. Amen. But, you know, during that time, that season of believing for our daughter, we saw a lot of other people well, a lot of other people healed. And people, and, but we, you know, we prayed for our daughter, but, you know, we didn't see her healed. There was a period of time where we, we you know, it could have been frustrating because we, didn't, we saw everyone else healed that we were praying for, but we didn't see our daughter healed. And, you know, there were some missing pieces. There were some preconceived ideas in our heart where we didn't really understand how the word of God applied to a child that wasn't old enough to believe it yet. You see, we understood we believe and we receive, but how can a three-year-old believe? They don't know what, they don't know what the word is. They, they're not, you know, they haven't uh, read, the, the, read the scriptures, right? They don't have the level of comprehension. How do they know about faith and unbelief? And, you know, how do, how do we, I mean, we just didn't understand it. And so we had that, you know, that stumbling block, that stumbling block of, of ignorance in the word of God was keeping us from praying a prayer of faith. Let me say, you cannot pray a prayer of faith if you don't know the will of God. It's impossible. The, you know, faith can only operate where the will of God is known. That's why Jesus said to the leper when he asked him if I can be cleansed, you know, I'm willing to be cleansed. If we don't first know that God wants us to be well, we're never going to pray a prayer of confidence. We'll be, we'll be praying stupid prayers. I've prayed a lot of stupid prayers. We prayed stupid prayers over our daughter. Stupid prayers are the prayers that say, oh, God, please come on down and heal so-and-so. You know what? That's not, that's not according to the word of God. You know, Jesus never prayed like that. He never begged the Father to come heal anybody. He said, be well, be healed, right? Get up, take up your bed and walk, right? He spoke to the issue. He spoke the desired end results. He said to his disciples, you have faith in God. You speak to the mountain and tell it to be cast into the sea, Mark 11. Have faith in God. And, you know, when you, when you pray, believe. There's a lot of people that pray and don't believe. Isn't it shocking, isn't it? Shocking that people could pray and not have any belief behind it. But, you know, if you're praying and you're speaking and you're not seeing any results, some of that time is because there's no faith behind it. They're just words. But we have to believe and therefore we speak, not speak in order to believe. That's backwards. So this woman here, she believed the promise of God. She believed what, what the, the, the servant, um, the um, prophet rather, had told her. And she said, it's going to be well. It's going to be well. There's no other option. Did you see here? She, she repeats this several times until she's going on. She, I think it's three times. She repeats the same thing. It is well. It is well. It is well with my soul. There's no other option. There's no other outcome that is possible than my child coming back to life. There's nothing else on the table. That's faith. You see that? That's trust. That's a confidence in there. Now, I want to show you something that's really interesting. She gets um, out quite a ways out there from the prophet, and, she, um, and he sees her, right? And so in 20, verse 29, it says, he says to Gehazi, that the, he approached, he says, the man of uh, God, um, where are we going here? Okay, verse 27, go up to verse 27. When she came, the, ma the man of God at the mountain, she grabbed his feet. Gehazi approached to push her away, but the man of God says, let her be alone for she's in distress, Right? And she said, did I not ask for a son for my Lord? And going on down to verse 27, then he said to Gehazi, this is, this, is, um, the, this is Elisha's servant, prepare yourself, take my staff in your hand and go. And if you find anyone on the way, don't greet him. In other words, go directly there and lay my staff on the face of the boy. But this is what I want you to see, because you see, what we believe determines how we will receive it. So if we believe that when we pray, we're going to get a little bit better every day, progressively better. That is what we give God to work with. So then we can get our healing a little bit better every day, progressively better. If we believe, you know what, when someone say loads of hands on me, when they anoint me with oil, when they speak the word, when they come to my house, whatever it is, right, when I, when, when I put my hand in the air, when I touch the hem of his garment, that is the point at which I'm going to get healed and I'm going to get instantly healed. That's how we're going to get healed. 
Because that's how we determine in our heart how we're going to receive. So if you don't like the way that you're receiving, change the way that you're believing. Right? Change, what, change the way that you believe you're going to receive. This woman had a set mind on how that she thought this was going to go about. Right? And so he sends off his servant. Elisha sends off his servant with the staff. He goes ahead of Elisha. I guess he ran faster or something. I don't know. He goes there. He puts the staff on the face of the boy. But it says there was, in verse uh, 31, there's no sound or response. But look at what she says in verse 30. As the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave without you. She determined in her heart, I'm not leaving here, Elisha, without you. She, in her heart, she believed if that prophet went with her to her house, that was the point at which her boy was going to receive, not the staff. So then it makes sense, doesn't it? No, no wonder when Gehazi went to the house and put the staff on the boy. He didn't wake up because that's not how his mother was believing and receiving. She determined that. She determined that. You know, this is interesting because... It, you know, I believe that Elisha and Elijah were really close. They hung out a lot, right? One, the, the older trained the younger. And, you know, if you go back into 1 Kings chapter 17, I bet that, that um, Elijah shared this story with Elisha. Do you remember the widow of Zarephath? It was almost an identical story. Right before the, the story of the Shumanite woman, there was a woman with oil that, that needed pots and it was overflowing. And then we see a story of a woman with a boy that was promised to her but died and the prophet came and raised him from the dead, right? Well, I can, I can, I'm almost convinced here that this is the case. I can't guarantee it, but I think there's too many similarities. I think this woman here heard the story of, of um, what happened with Elijah and the widow woman of Zarephath. And she knew she was a woman. She knew that, that, that the prophet was in town and he was doing multiplication of food, of oil. And then when her son got sick, she said, there's too many similarities. Go on over here to, to 1 Kings chapter 17. And verse uh, 7, we'll, we'll pick it up in verse 17. But this is just the widow of Zarephath. She had meal that was running out. The prophet Elijah came into town and he says, you know what, you start with what you have. Just give me a little bit of a meal. You know, before you make your last, your last meal for you and your son and die, get, take that little bit of flour and you make a meal for me, right? Very similar to the widow woman with oil that happened right before, right in the neighborhood of the Shunammite woman. Right, And so they saw that miracle, the, the, the jar of oil didn't run out, the meal did not run out. In verse 17 it says, Later on, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became terribly sick, so much so that it had no breath left in him. Her son got sick too. But she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, man of God? Have you come to, to remind me of, his, of your sin? And he said, Give me your son. And he carried him and he put him on the bed. He laid on top of him. He says in verse 21, he stretched himself upon the child three times, cried to the Lord and said, God, my God, I pray that you'll let this child's soul come into him again. And the child was raised up. And the woman in verse 24 said to Elijah, now because of this, I know, I know that you are a man of God and the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. Can you imagine hearing that story passed down, right? And suddenly you find yourself in a situation that seems remarkably like that other woman in that story that you heard about. Thinking, hang on a minute, if God healed that woman's son that way, then he's going to heal my son that way too. She, I think she said it in her heart. I need the prophet to come and lay face to face on my son. And her faith was at the point was, if it happens this way, he's going to be raised from the dead. That's why when Gehazi went out with his staff, he came back empty-handed because she wasn't believing that way. She was believing the way. She had a preconceived idea about this whole, how this whole thing was going to come to pass. You know, this is important because we can determine how we receive according to what we believe. You know, when the prophet went in, going back to 2 Kings 4 here, when the prophet went in to the, the boy's room in, um, I mean, 2 Kings 4, um, 33, so, so he went in and he shut the door on the two of them. Man, there's a whole message here on shut the door. We need to shut the door on some preconceived ideas. Some of the things that you've been thinking are junk. They're not helping you. 
Sometimes we go through life, bad stuff happens, and we develop these coping mechanisms. Just don't want to get our hopes up because we don't want to be disappointed. If we don't hope for anything, then we won't be disappointed, right? If we don't trust anyone, then we won't be hurt, right? And those, those coping mechanisms may have served you well in the past, but they're hindering you now. You've outgrown them. You don't need them anymore. Now you have the Lord in your life. You have a father that's going to take care of you, that's going to protect you, that's never going to let help go his grip on you, that loves you, that he sent his word to heal you, that has provided for you, that has protected you against the enemy. Right? You don't need to keep up this hedge of protection anymore, these preconceived ideas. We just need to take the, the word of the Lord at his word. Because if we don't, we're not going to be able to receive what it says, the promises that it promises us. We can receive lots of other things, but not the ones that we want, right? So it says here, he shut the door. He shut out the, the world. You know, sometimes to receive something, you've got to be single-minded, right? Almost obsessed, right? The world's going to brainwash you, right? But if we brainwash ourselves with the truth of God's word, guess what? That seed of God's word in our heart, it's going to come up. You can't stop seed from sprouting and bearing fruit when it's in good soil. You just can't. It's going to bear fruit. It's going to do exactly what it says on the tin if it was in a tin. But sometimes we've got to shut out the things of the world to stop the words and the sounds of the world affecting the sound of the word in our life. Super important. So shut the door. Shut the door on some things. Sometimes we need to cut off some relationships. We need to cut off some voices. We need, sometimes we need to cut off the TV. Whatever it is, right? And the other thing she does, she runs to the man of God. Oftentimes when people are going through a crisis, you know what? They, they, they get to a point where they give up and they blame God and they're angry at God and they're disappointed at God because it hasn't happened according to their time frame. And they run from God rather than to God. But they still want to blame God. doesn't really make sense when you logic it out, but it's, it's there. It's really in our hearts, right? You can't run from God and blame God at the same time, right? But you know what? Here's the answer. Here's the answer. So we need to be running to God, making space for him in our life. She only speaks the desired end result. This is so important that we get our believing, hook, our speaking rather, hooked up to our believing. We need to get our speaking hooked up to our believing because if we don't, the devil can see the same opportunities in your life that you can. And he'll do everything he can to intervene and keep you from them. Do you remember, you know, the scripture, it escapes me where it is, but it says that, that the Lord, he stands at the door and knocks. Jesus, he stands at the door and knocks, right? A door in the scripture is, yes, it's a door, obviously, an entry or exit, but it's a moment of opportunity. And the Lord is not going to burst in on our life. He's not going to come in uninvi uninvited. He needs an invitation. He's right there behind the door, but we still need to respond by opening it. And you think that the problem with this is, you know, the devil sees the same opportunity. And it, sometimes he sees opportunities in our life before we do and tries to intervene before we see them. And that's why it says in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 9 that, that the great and effective door is opened to you, but there are many adversaries. You know, there's 101 reasons in the world why the world doesn't think you should receive supernatural healing. Right? There's 101 things we could go around and say all these different obstacles for people receive from, from, to keep people from receiving their healing. Wrong thinking, bad teaching, you know, people are mad at God, people feel condemned, people feel like they aren't worthy to receive. You couldn't be worthy anyway, it's a gift. It's a gift, you can't earn this. Right? You can't earn it with your goodness, you can't dis not earn it with your badness. Right? You can't dis-earn it. dis -earn it? I don't know, anyway. Right? Here's the thing. This is a gift. This is a gift. You can't disqualify yourself from receiving it. But in order to receive what we believe, we have a choice. You know, in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, you know, the, the Lord says, I set before you life and death, therefore choose life, that you and your descendants might live. That you and your descendants might live. That means that we have a choice. We, what we receive tonight is based on the choice that we make here in these seats. Not the choices that you've made coming in here, but the choices you make right here in this moment. 
Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that picture that you imagined at the beginning of the well person, the well you, the healed you. And I want you to bring that back into your, the forefront of your imagination. Some of you might need to close your eyes to the point that you can see it, right? But this is a choice that we need to make. The Lord spoke this to me um, years ago. I was sitting in a women's Bible study and I had epilepsy for, you know, a, a decade, multiple seizures a day, had to have a babysitter for me, couldn't drive a car, you know, Ashley says I still can't drive a car, he's just being cheeky, okay. But here's the thing, our life was really challenged by the situation. He'd come home from work, find me on the floor somewhere, I mean, I had to have a babysitter for me because I couldn't be left alone with our three kids because I was having so many seizures. It was really, it was really challenging on our life. It was challenging on our marriage. It was challenging on our finances. It was just, it was a very difficult situation. And, you know, I went to this, this lady's Bible study in the middle of the day one time. And, you know, it's amazing how you just, people, the human nature is very resilient. And especially if you've come from a place of having to learn to cope with stuff, it's almost like you have a hardness about you, a capacity to just deal with, with bad situations. And so another, you know, one bad situation happens after another and you just suck it up and deal, deal with it because you've learned how to deal with it. You've learned to manage crisis. You've learned to manage symptoms. You've learned to manage diseases. That's something the Lord never called you to do. That's a burden you weren't designed to carry, right? This is why, you know, in, in First Peter, cast your cares upon the Lord. But if we're so insistent on carrying them, we'll never invite him into the situation. Some of us are sick because we haven't given up our sickness. Think about that for a moment, right? The Lord showed me something. You know, I'd been sick um, for so long, I'd forgotten what it was like to be well. I thought sick, I dreamed sick, I imagined sick, you know, I spoke sick, I identified with being sick. Um, on forms, I wrote, all, you know, your, me your medical history. You have to declare everything for any application, I don't know, whatever it was, right? I was Carly the epileptic. It wasn't just a sickness that it was in my body. You see, it had gotten on the inside of me. This is what sickness does. It gets into become, till it becomes your identity, and that's a problem because you identify more with the lifestyle of sickness, with the current circumstances, than you do with the healed picture of you that the Lord wants you to receive. So it's really difficult for you to believe and receive when your picture of you and your experience is only sick and your words are only sick. And, you cl and sickness isn't just in your flesh, it's gone into your soul, right? There is a soul sickness, a part of it that becomes I, I, your identity. And the thing with sickness, because it's by its very nature, it's a fruit of the enemy. It bears all of the hallmarks of the enemy. It's selfish. Sickness is selfish at its root. It wants all of your time. It wants all of your attention. It wants all of your money, your relationships, your passion, your desires, your dreams, and it is relentless. It wants all of you right? It's indiscriminate. It wants all of you until it takes over and you identify with it and it becomes the greater voice that you listen to in your day-to-day -day than the Word of God report. That's why Psalm 1720 says he sent his Word and healed you. He sent his, he didn't send the doctor, he sent his Word. He sent his Word and healed you because his Word contains all, all more than enough power necessary to fulfill it. His word is the power that brings healing into our bodies. So if we are identifying with a wrong picture, if we are identifying with a wrong report, we are going to struggle when it comes to where we place the word of God as, as a position of value in our life. Which do we value more, the doctor's report or the word of God? We get to choose life or death. The choice is ours. God loves you anyway, right? God loves you anyway. You don't have to believe in healing. You can go to, to heaven quicker without it. But if you want to fulfill the potential of God in your life, then you do not want to let the promise of healing escape you. It means something to you. It means something to the generations after you. He says, choose life that you and your descendants might live. And so as I was in this woman's Bible study, the Lord spoke this, that very scripture to me, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. And he, and he showed me the picture of a simple light switch. Just on the inside of my imagination, I saw it by faith, not with my natural eyes. You have to see by faith, you know. 
things that we can't see in the natural, we have to see them with the eyes of faith. And so I, I saw this, this picture on the inside of me of this, of this simple light switch. And the Lord said, you know what? When you're ready, you can turn epilepsy off. I thought, I cannot share this with anyone. They're going to think I'm loopy, right? They're going to they're call the doctor. They're going to think, like, I'm crazy. I need psychiatric help with this matter. Because, you know, our experience up until that point wasn't one of mer- miracles. It wasn't one where we didn't grow up in an environment where this kind of happened in our church. We had sickness services in our church, right? It was like, bring out your dead. I don't know what we were doing. We were praying, but, you know, we never saw anything, right? If someone had a headache and it got better by taking six Tylenol, then praise God, they were healed. I'm like, yeah, that's not really a he- Do you know what I mean? There's healing and there's healing, you know? I mean, praise God. Anyway, so we didn't grow up in that environment. And so when God said, you know, you can be healed of this if you choose to be, actually he said to me, in two weeks' time, you can be healed of this if you choose to be. And I thought, that's a really weird thing to say. So I went home and I prayed and I'm like, Lord, you're going to have to show me. Yeah, I just didn't know. My, I had some preconceived ideas that were hindering. What I believed was hindering what I received. So, you know what, I had a preconceived idea of God that he was putting sickness on people to teach him something. And while I believed that, guess what? Sickness was having a field day in my life. I was receiving everything that I was believing for. It just wasn't the things that I wanted. And my faith wasn't broken. It was working perfectly in the areas that I didn't want it to bear fruit in, right? And so um, through, through that journey of two weeks, the Lord showed me in the Word that he had a healing ministry, that he was a good God, that he wanted to be me, me to be well, and that faith had something to do with it. He took me to Acts 14, verse 9. It says, seeing that they had faith to be healed. My lightning fast mind says, oh, man, this, has, this faith thing, this believing thing has something to do with me receiving my healing. Well, duh, right? I mean, I'm just a, I guess I was just a bit slow or something. Look, it says here, this man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed. The Lord spoke that scripture to me. I'm like, seeing that I have faith to be healed, I have to have faith. I have to trust God's word. I mean, he spoke, he'd been speaking to me this whole two weeks during this time. And still my prayer was, well, Lord, after two weeks, if it be your will, Lord, <laughs> right? Because I still had an element of me that was just religious. Guess what? You don't have to understand the word perfectly. You just have to believe it. That's going to set someone free right there. You don't have to believe perfectly, right? You don't, you don't have to understand everything that's in here. It's called trust and confidence. I don't understand it, Lord, but, but I trust you. I trust you. I'm confident that whatever you said is good, let it be unto me according to your word, right? And that's enough to get you to receive it. You know, I didn't put my faith in my faith. We can't put our faith in our ability to believe anything, right? My faith's not in my faith. My faith's in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me and rose from the dead so I don't have to be sick anymore, right? My faith's in his finished work. When he said it was finished, I believe him. I believed him. And so, you know, that took, but it took a period of a couple of weeks for me to get this down into my heart, to get through the, the religious swamp that had settled in there, and to see these truths in the Word of God. God knew it would take two weeks. That's all that two weeks was about. It wasn't His limitations. It was the limitation was my own heart, right? You don't have to wait two weeks. You can have it instantly. You don't have to wait two weeks. You can have it right now. And so I went back to that woman's Bible study two weeks later, didn't tell anyone. But I, my, here was my fleece, right? I was still an Old Testament girl. And so and uh, I said, Lord, I feel like Gideon here. It's an Old Testament prayer. It's not a good prayer, but God worked with me. Praise you. That's grace. He'll work with you. And uh, I said, Lord, I'm going to lay out a fleece here. I'm not going to say anything to anybody about what you've been speaking to me about. But um, if my friend offers to pray for me, we were at a prayer meeting. <laughs> and the odds were pretty good, right? If my friend offers to, to pray for me, I'm going to know that this is your will for me to be made well. <laughs> Set the bar low. Don't ask for like three doves and a pigeon and, you know, just keep it simple. So anyway, go back to that prayer meeting. didn't say anything. All the way through that prayer meeting, no one prayed for me. <laughs> what? What the? Anyway, so I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know what? It's time to go get the kids from school. So we're on the way out of the door and we're walking down the garden path to the car. And my friend says to me, Carly, I don't know what it is. I need to pray for you. I'm like, yes, you do. <laughs> Waiting all afternoon for it, right? And, but we were rushed. We did not have time to pray one of those really long religious prayers, you know, saved by the blood of the Lamb, hallelujah, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost kind of prayers. We didn't have time to get the rosary out or any of that stuff, right? 
We hadn't fasted and prayed beforehand. I mean, we hadn't done communion. We hadn't, you know, we hadn't done, we weren't ready for this. We hadn't, you know, braced for impact. <laughs> so she, she just said, listen, I'm, I mean, it's going to have to be quick. So she slapped her hand on my shoulder and she says, be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. And off she goes, gets in the car. And I stood there watching her drive away. And something on the inside of me, I saw that picture of that switch again. And in my mind, I flipped the switch. In my mind, I chose life. Let me tell you, nothing changed on the outside. No one else could see what was going on. No one else knew what was going on. There was no signs of life anywhere else. But on the inside of me, it was too late. The decision had already been made. I had turned epilepsy off. Amen. You know, this is the power of choice that we have tonight. We can choose to believe and receive. Never underestimate the power of that choice. You know, the greatest decision many of you, all of us, will ever make, and many of you already have, is the choice to receive Jesus. And so I'm going to pray specifically for healing tonight, but I know there's going to be opportunity as well for people to receive salvation. Don't leave here if you've never done that. Because what's the point in receiving healing if you've never received salvation? You'll be comfortable in this life and spend the rest of your life in eternity miserable, right? Man, you need to know what happens if you wake up one day and you find yourself, you know, so are you going to wake up one day and find yourself in heaven or are you going to find yourself forever apart from God? Man, we need to know that. We need to have that eternal peace on the inside of us. But the, the, the decision, the choice tonight, is entirely ours to make. Do I have anyone in here that says, you know what, I'm ready to make the decision. I choose to believe and receive. Do I have anyone in here that's ready to, to, to pray with me to receive what God has for you that wants to receive healing tonight? All right? Anyone in here that's sick that says, I need to receive healing and I choose to receive it. Do I have anyone in here like that? Put your hands up. So I'm going to see you where you are. It's hard because the lights are bright. So keep your hand. Wave like a crazy person that's excited that you just got about to win the lottery. Look at those hands. They're beautiful hands. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. How many believers do I have in here? Come on. I'm going to ask you again. How many believing believers? I only want, oh, I've got one right there. I only want the believing kind. Okay. Believing believers, put your hands up. Come on now. Right. Because you know what? You can be an unbelieving believer. Right? You can. But the believing believers, they're the ones that are crazy. They're going to take the Word of God and say, I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care what the prognosis is. I don't care how long this pain has been hanging around, but I'm about to evict it. Right? It doesn't matter what happened before you walked in here. What happens right now is in this moment. In this moment, there is nothing that happened before you walked in this room that can disqualify you from receiving in this moment. Do you believe that? Amen. So believing believers... I want you to look at your hands. Say, these are healing hands. My hands. Lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. Amen. So now rub your hands together until they're nice and warm. This isn't magic. It's just don't like cold hands being laid on me. That's, that's it, really. And it gets people awake and doing something when they may have been sleeping. So here's what we're going to do. If you need healing, I want you to stand up in your seat right where you are. Yep, you're going to have to move. Stand up in your seat. If you can't stand, you can indicate to the person next to you. Perfect. Awesome. Now, the people that were just rubbing their hands together, where are they? Okay, you're all there. Perfect. So if you're sitting down, you're going to need to move. I know, but this, you know what? We were talking about fear and intimidation. You don't need to be afraid of people. Right? God's put the pow his power to raise the dead on the inside of you. And the scripture says that believers, believing believers, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So if you're sitting down, I want you to lay hands on a person that's close by you that's standing up. Okay? Could be your neighbor. Could be your friend. Could be your enemy. Doesn't really matter. Just lay your hand on the shoulder. I'm going to pray. Or I just need you to, to be the hands. Okay? Just need you to be the hands. Perfect. Until everyone that stood up to uh, respond has a hand laid on them. Is everyone covered? Anyone on their own that stood up to respond? Everyone good? Wave if you... Can't see you because the lights are in my eyes. We all good? Okay, perfect. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray and the power of God is going to flow through from your spirit where the, healing, where the healer lives and it's going to infiltrate every cell in your body. 
It's going to infiltrate every organ in your body until sickness and disease has nowhere left to hide. We're going to stand up to the playground bully of sickness and disease and we're going to stop him from stealing our Slim Jim right in this moment. We're going to stop him from stealing our energy, our life, God's plan for us, our potential our destiny, our energy, our future, our money. We're going to stop him from stealing from us. Amen. Do you believe that? All right. So if you have a prayer language, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to start praying in tongues. In a moment. But what I wanted to do is oftentimes during these moments of ministry, the Lord will show me what he's doing. And he'll show me sometimes specific conditions that he that he's working on right there in that moment. And if you hear one that you think, man, I've got that. That's what, that's what my diagnosis is. I want you to raise your hand. So I need you to listen to me when I'm praying, okay, so that you can hear. Sometimes your neighbor will hear on your behalf and nudge you. That's fine too, okay. Because I want to see those raised hands and then I'm going to direct my prayer specifically towards you. Does that make sense? If you hear something that I speak out that pertains to you, your part is say, let it be unto me according to your word. Okay? And you put your hand up. But everyone else is just going to, everyone else, all of our prayer ministers that are laying hands on, your job is simply to pray in tongues. You don't need to be praying in English. You just need to be praying in your prayer language. You got that? All right, really simple. Okay, so let's start praying in our prayer language. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your power is here, that your power is in us, that it's flowing through us from the very tops of our heads to the very soles of our feet. Right now, in Jesus' name, we take authority over every lie of the enemy, over every prognosis that came from the pit of hell, we command all sickness and all disease to leave in Jesus' name. The spirit of infirmity to get out of these bodies right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that your power is flowing through us. It's touching the brain. It's moving around components with inside the neurological system right now. Injuries to the brain right now. We command these to be healed in Jesus' name. Issues, neurological issues in Jesus' name. Seizure disorders right now. Be gone. We can we take authority over seizures of every kind, over memory loss. Right now, we declare over you the memory of the righteous is blessed. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for bringing all things back to our remembrance. We come against Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and dementia and tremors and and seizure disorders in Jesus' name. Issues of stroke where there has been injury. Lord, I thank you for correcting correcting um, pathways in the brain as they connect to the nervous system. I said the Lord says He's healing the nervous system where there's issues of the nerves, issues of the nerves running through the body, where there is neuropathy, where there is chronic pain, where there's fibromyalgia, where there is a, 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 I see somebody, you've had um, a virus, like a shingles type thing at some point, and there's leftover pain in the, in, around your um, sides and in, in, in your elbows and down your your sides of your body. Right now, the Lord is healing you of chronic pain in your body. We take authority over that and we command pain, be gone. Leave in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that the, the nerves of the feet, neuropathy, in the feet and, and, and just shooting pains, sciatica. Right now, we take authority over you and we command you to be at peace. We command these nerves to become uninflamed. There's inflammation. I see the Lord healing inflammation in the body, in different parts of the body right now. We command that inflammation to leave, to leave every single part of you, to leave all of your organs, your intestines in Jesus' name. Right now, to leave your joints right now in the name of Jesus. Arthritis, leave, leave. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. I, I take authority over joints that are, that are swollen, that are stiff, that are immovable. Right now, we speak movement, movement, lubrication back into those joint systems. 
We command backs to be straight and strong. Someone's had an issue with their neck for, for quite a while. The Lord is making your neck to move without pain, without problems right now. The compression that has happened right now is being relieved. Where there's compression in the spinal column, the Lord's relieving that compression. He's relieving that compression. Somebody's had an issue with their bone marrow, an issue with their bone marrow, but the Lord is making that whole. He's making it new again. I see a pain in the shin, in the shin bone down this front part of the leg. Right now, we just declare that whole and healed. Thank you, Lord. I declare strength back to bones. Strength back to bones where they have been brittle, where they have been uh, lacking in density. Right now, we command those to be strong and whole. Somebody has had a, a pain. I think it's a surgery even to in their shoulder area, in the realm of their shoulder. Right now, the Lord is healing you in your shoulder. And uh, you know what? You just need to move, bend, stretch, do something right down the elbow, right down through the elbow. There's a, there's a weakness of grip in the hand, but the Lord is healing you in that area. Thank you, Lord. You, somebody has an ankle problem where their ankle just has rolled over at some point rolled over and it's caused an injury that's, that's just hung around. Right here, I see that right now. We just command those ankles to be strong, those bones to be strong in Jesus' Name, those ligaments to be made whole, whole and sure and steady. No more damage with the ligaments and the tendons. Right now, we call them to be attached. We call them to be complete. We call them to be supple in Jesus' name with the right amount of elasticity. Thank you. Firmly attached. Full range of movement. We declare full range of movement in those ankles, in those shoulders, in those joints, in the hips. Right now, we speak alignment. Somebody has had a problem walking. You have had a problem with steadiness on your feet. We're walking unassisted, but the Lord is making you strong. He's making you stable. Right now, we command that gate to be normal in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Sure-footed, sure-footed. Thank you, Lord, for an improvement in balance and coordination. Balance and coordination, strength throughout the body, strength throughout the, the lumbar region right now. Thank you, Lord. That coccyx become whole again. That tailbone become whole again in Jesus' name. I see a bundle, a bundle of nerves and arteries that have become those twisted together and it's affecting circulation. It's causing nerve problems, pinching, pains, different things like that. The Lord, is there's an untangling. An untangling right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. This circulatory system is working once more. We just declare over it, blood flows to every cell in your body as it should. Oxygenated blood reaches every single part of your body exactly where it's supposed to be. Lord, thank you for opening up this circulation. Varicose veins right now. Be untangled. Be unswollen. These pain in the calf muscles right now. Be unswollen. Thank you, Lord. I just declare over the intestinal system. Somebody's had severe reflux and irritable bowel syndrome. I see a Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, diverticulitis right now. We just come on. Peace. Peace into the intestines. You shall process. You shall absorb. You shall digest food in Jesus' name. That colon cancer, you're out of here. That cancer, you're out of here right now. We curse you at the root. We curse you at the very root. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for opening up lungs. I see lungs becoming filled with oxygen. They're filled with oxygen. They're perfusing oxygen. Throughout them, they, they were grey, but they're becoming pink again. Every part of you becoming whole. There's parts of somebody's heart that's almost greyed out from a previous heart attack. There's cells of the heart that have died because they, they lacked oxygen. But right now, the Lord is creating in you a brand new heart. A brand new heart. Every part of that heart muscle functioning as it should beating as it should. All of the valves, all of the ventricles becoming whole, becoming new. Energy, life coming back to every single part of your body 
right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we believe it. We receive it. Lord, I thank you that no one will stop breathing in their sleep. No more sleep apnea. Your body will stay open. Your airways will stay open. Thank you, Lord. Pancreas, life to you. We speak life to you right now. Diabetes, you be, we're done with you. We're done with you. We command that blood sugar to normalize. We command that glycogen storage issue to be resolved right now. Insulin, there's a problem with insulin, but it's not diabetes. It's like insulin insulinuloma or something like that. Anyway, whatever it is with the insulin right now and the production of it, we just command that to be as it was created to be. As it was, somebody's had an issue with fibroids. Fibroids over here right now. We said, shrivel up. Leave. Go back to where you came from. Be gone from our body right now. Hemorrhoids. Be gone right now. That swelling go down in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for dissolving cysts. And there's a fatty deposits. Somebody has had issues with lipids in their bloodstream, lipid levels. Right now, um, we just command those things to dissolve, those impurities to be gone from our body. There's a condition that the Lord is, is bringing to me. It's called um, Addison's, I think it is, Addison's disease. Right now, the Lord is healing Addison's disease and adrenal fatigue in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank Myasthenia gravis. Right now, we command you to leave this diaphragm. We command you to leave. We speak life to you. We speak coordination to you. We say lungs function, diaphragm function in Jesus' name. Some of you have had a terminal diagnosis spoken over you. And when the Lord says, it is cancelled tonight, right now, you will live long. <laughs> the Lord has a sense of humour. He says, you will live long and prosper. I'm thinking of Star Trek. Anyway, you're funny. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He, somebody's got an issue with mold spores and it's affected mold in their house. It's affected them in different ways right there. The Lord is cleansing your body from the effects of mold spores in your house where you've been right now. I take authority over Lyme disease. You've been bitten by something at some point. You've, there's, there's heavy metal deposits in your body somewhere, chemical sensitivities, all kinds of organs that are out of whack. I see lupus as well. Right now, we take authority over those lying diseases. We say, be gone in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Kid. We turn on hearing. You know what? We've got ears to hear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Ears, hear. Hear right now. Thank you, Lord. We command that ringing to cease. That ringing to cease. That conductive hearing loss to be gone. We turn up the volume. We turn up the volume. We command those ears to hear every pitch, every tone, every decibel in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank, we speak strength. You know, Moses was 120 and he says his, his eyesight was not dimmed and his health was not abated. So right now we declare health over all of our body. You will not retire. You will refire, says the Lord. You will refire energy in your old age, vision in your old age. Some of you, you need to start dreaming again. Just because you've gotten to be a pensioner doesn't mean you can't have vision, right? Vision for your life and vision for your sight. In Jesus' name, we command these eyes to see with, uh, with, with clarity, to see with clarity, to see with purpose. Thank you, Lord. Someone's really concerned about their retirement. But the Lord says, don't worry, I've got you covered. I've got you covered. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or begging for bread. I've got you covered. I have ways of funding you that you did not know about. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right now, we receive everything that you have spoken tonight, Lord. Everything that you've spoken. Every, and you know what? Every area of our body. Every area of our body. There is no sickness. There is no virus that can come near our body and live. It's impossible. We are a germ graveyard. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This is where germs come to die. They die on contact. 
We declare over ourselves, over our families, over our households, that no plague is going to come near our dwelling. No plague is going to cross the threshold of our house. No plague is going to come into this temple of the Holy Spirit. That means no virus, no bacteria, no pneumonia can touch our body and live. No COVID virus, no flu virus, no any kind of viruses, right, can come near our body and live. We command strength and health. I speak over our immune system. It is healthy. It is strong. It knows how to respond. It works at full capacity in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Someone's got an autoimmune disease. Your immune system is in overdrive. Right now, we declare peace over your immune system. Peace. Peace over your immune system. Calm down. Right now. Right now, we take authority over, over issues of the thyroid. We command thyroids to function as they should. We come against Shrogan syndrome. We come, we come against um, a low thyroxine level. Right now, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for, for producing just the right amount of everything in our body on a consistent basis. All the right things in all the right places. Thank you, Lord. I see somebody, you've got a shifting going on on your insides. Like there was a prolapse. I see somebody with a pro, had a prolapse. I think this is to do with a bladder or a uterus, but I see those organs moving back into place, shifting and moving. Somebody's had a section of their intestines removed, but the Lord says, I can grow that back. Just watch me. Just watch me. You can be complete. I declare over you are complete. You are lacking nothing. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing removed. Thank you, Lord. There's an issue with a bone spur. I don't even know where this is, but a bone spur, a part of a bone that is grown weird. The Lord is dealing with that right now. Thank you, Lord. Somebody's had a ruptured eardrum. A ruptured eardrum. The Lord is healing you even in that right now. Complete restoration. Complete restoration of your hearing. There's a pain in the jaw that you can't open your mouth all the way without it hurting. It crunches, it clicks. You get uh, like a, a pain in your jaw when you move it. But the Lord is healing you even in that. Even in that. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we believe and we receive all of these perfect promises. Thank you, Jesus. Just give the Lord some praise for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We, we receive it, Lord. We receive that, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, listen to me. You know what? We need to, we need to try some things that we haven't tried before. I want to check yourself. Check yourself. How many of people can feel in their body there's a physical change in their body? Check yourself and put your hand up. You can feel a physical change. You got these hands going. Check yourself. Move, bend, stretch. Some of you need to touch your toes, wiggle. Put your hand up so I can see where you are. I can see some people there. If you feel a physical change in your body right then when we prayed. Perfect. Those people with their hands up. Can you just let them out? I want to meet you. Come on down here. Listen, this is really important. You got your hand. If you can feel a physical change in your body, get on down here really quickly. Give them a round of applause. I'm not going to do anything weird to you. Come on down here. Come on down here. Quick, 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 quick. If you feel a physical change in your body, right, something is different tonight. Something happened when we prayed just then. Give them a round of applause. This is awesome. Now listen, here's what happens. When, when you leave here, the enemy's going to try and convince you otherwise. What are you going to do? You're going you're gonna to resist him. Yes, right? Right? He can't steal from you unless you comply with him. And if you stand up to him, he can't steal it from you. You know, Revelations 12, 11 says, We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. testimony. Okay, so now I know you've probably got some preachers among you. We ain't going to be preaching. We're going to be testifying, all right? So Ash is going to come up okay. here and help me. you turn around. Yeah, turn around and face the people. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Don't be shy. Actually, Turn around I think if you can stand there on the step here, you'll okay. be in the light. If you can come, okay. take a step back so that the can lights catch step, you. Can just you take see? A step to your right. Can you see their faces? Just go there, go there. Yeah. So, so we want to make fine. sure That's they fine. can see you. That's fine. There we go. Perfect. That's great. Okay. Right here. What happened, sir? Well, uh, I was being prayed over, and I was believing for a lot of different things in my body. Um, I've had some pancreatic issues where I'm not uh, breaking down foods and getting the stuff that I need in my body for nutrients. Uh, I was in a 36-hour uh, coma 
four and a half years ago and I've lost some memory and uh, it's caused some uh, issues with me learning how to deal with ADHD, which I've had my whole life, but losing memory of how to deal with that has been a struggle. So what happened tonight? So tonight, <laughs> so tonight, all of the, all the thoughts of me just having this thing have just dissipated. I've been healed of all the things that have been keeping me from receiving the healing. And I started moving my shoulder around after receiving that healing from my rotator cuff surgery and there's not any pain. Was there pain before when you did yes. that? There was pain before when you did that? It's been way around without pain in it. And now it's, now it's healed. All I any pain? Any pain? No pain whatsoever. Hallelujah, yeah, healed, that's awesome. Praise God. That's awesome. Amen, that's awesome. What happened? Well, I had a real, I, ha I have had for a long time a real tightness in my chest and it affects me in my breathing area just like and especially at night when I sleep. So I came here tonight and it was really tight, you know, and I was, but my alarm loose. You can feel your chest is loose now. So before, when you came in, it came in tight and now it's loose. Take a big breath. How's it, how's it feel? Good. Awesome. You're healed. That's awesome. Praise God. That's awesome. Take a, what happened? I was um, prognosed with multiple myeloma. I had a cancer mass from the top of my spine to the bottom just recently. I was in five ERs. None of them obviously read the CAT scan. I was in so much pain. And the was you in pain on the way here? Was you in pain tonight? I've been doing, um, uh, I've been doing uh, radiation for number 15. And I was in pain, yes. I've had multiple from everything. So you was in pain when you came in? How are you now? completely I feel like the static went through my body and it left I'm standing up straight have you moved around stretch how's it feel oh, sorry yes how's it feel how's it feel turn around any pain no hallelujah healed thank you Jesus that's awesome praise God that is awesome that's awesome and I needed help to get to the point where I could believe well, you've received tonight. You've received tonight. Thank you, Jesus. That's awesome. Are you testifying? Are you, are you testifying? Yes. I had pain, sciatica, blood pressure. Something was going wrong with my neck, um, my, my jaw, it's everything. So when she laid hands on me, I just felt the power of God. Just all through my whole body, I just felt hot. And so I know that I'm healed. Praise God. That's a double healing right there. That's awesome. Go ahead and take a seat so I can keep going. Praise the Lord. What happened? There was multiple, multiple things, but um, there was just, I got hot through one of them and then another. I just, there was a piece. I have had stomach surgeries and I have autoimmune issues and I, there was just this warmth and then it was just calm. I was boohooing and then it was just a calm. So I know that it's gone. You know you're healed, don't you? I do. That's awesome. Praise God. Healed. Praise God. You are healed. That's awesome. What happened? So for years I've been feeling pain along my spine and my ankle. Pain in your spine and your ankle? How long for? Years. I don't even know how long. But I don't feel anymore. No pain? If it's twisted, bent over? <laughs> Bending over backwards, look at that. Any pain? Nope. Would it have hurt before? Yes, absolutely. And no pain now? Mm -mm. How about your ankle? How's the pain? No pain. No pain. You're healed. That's awesome. Praise God. Hallelujah. What happened, miss? Come on over. I know you can. Come on over. Don't be shy. What happened? A year and a half ago, I fell and um, hurt my back really bad. And it's taken a year and a half. And I can't get surgery. And I couldn't get anybody to help me. And I just kept praying to God that he would send me to somebody like you guys to find somebody to help me pray. <laughs> and in that, when I finally got a doctor to help me, they found out that I have two aneurysms. I have a th thoracic and an aortic aneurysm. God told me yesterday that I was coming here and that I would be healed. Today, when I was standing back there, my legs started to jerk and I haven't felt this leg in a long time. Wow. 
and it started to pop and it, it started to feel so weird. And I was like, Lord, are you sitting around here someplace? Do you see this? When's the last time you felt that in your leg? When's the last time you felt feeling your leg? Oh, gosh. Um, I walk every day. I made a promise to the Lord that I'll never lay down. Until you lay me down, I'm not going to lay down. And I said, I will beat this. I will beat these aneurysms, and I will beat this. And I have not felt... Um, I have dragged my leg. I drag it with this. It feels great. Oh. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Mm. Wow. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That's progress, eh? Huh? What did you say? That's progress. Yeah, that's progress. You're not dragging a leg? The healing powers entered your body. I'm telling you, you are healed in Jesus' name. That's awesome. I feel like I'm standing up straight now, but I'm not. You know, so I am. Yeah. Come on, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. That's awesome. You look younger than you did when you came in here. You look younger than you did when you came in here. Um, thank you, everybody. I felt your prayers. I felt people behind me. I could hear them. I could hear the prayers I could I could feel that we all really do care for the next person Amen. and it was such a, a wonderful feeling to have everybody here praying for everybody Amen. you're healed praise God that's awesome praise the hallelujah thank you Jesus what happened um, I identified with what she said as far as managing you know, I, I just recently hurt my back in Costa Rica, came back, and I was healed. Not a pain since then, but I have managed ankles and knees and never thought it was important enough to pray about. Sure. Never thought about it because, it, it, you know, you just do what you got to do. And um, I was back praying for a couple that, that have been on my heart for several weeks now. And um, it just kept saying, why are you managing? Why are you managing? And when she said something about the ankles and the knees and the cartilage, I felt strength. And um, I've had wobbly knees and wobbly ankles, and, and they feel so much better now. Any pain? No pain. Pain's going to... How do they feel? You tried them out? Come on. Woo! Jumper. How does it feel? It feels good. Any pain? No pain. No more managing pain because you're healed. That's awesome. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. What happened? Well, I've, uh, for years I've had high blood pressure and I've been on uh, stuff called amylodipine. And uh, I've also had, a uh, doctor told me that I had no cartilage in my knees. I've had people pray for me before and it's gotten better. Um, Keith over here prayed for me one night. And it, they got better, and I don't know. It just is like a process, and I just felt my knees. I can start bending them. I can yeah. praise yeah. the Lord. And uh, I know my blood pressure is going down. I want to be medication free. I just thank Jesus for coming and healing me. And that's awesome. Praise God. You received it, brother. That's awesome. I'm excited for you. That's awesome. Praise God. What happened? I had two separate moments where I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in my heart. Um, one was for epilepsy and the other one was for diabetes. I also don't hear the ringing in my ear anymore. You used to have a ringing in your ear? So you had ringing in your ear when you came into the meeting? Yeah, I had been dealing with uh, having had tinnitus. And how long have you had tinnitus for? Uh, more than five years. More than five years ringing in the ear and any ringing in your ear now? None. none. Any at all? None. Any pain or anything? No. You're healed, praise God. That's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for testifying. What happened, miss? Uh, I've had like an earache trying to come on me for about the last month and some uh, jaw pain. Jaw pain and earache? And my ear sort of felt a little bit blocked as well. So um, that all feels great now. No p more pain in my jaw. Or no pain in your jaw? Have you, moved it? Have you opened your mouth and moved your jaw around? How does it feel? Great. Any pain? No. Hallelujah. Praise God. You're healed. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, let's stand up and give Jesus some praise for those healings. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That's awesome. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you so much. 
We worship you, Lord, for your healing power. Praise